You know, this past week we were at lunch, and normally we don't, I don't preach two weeks in a row, but I made the statement to Dad, you know, you, in light of everything going on in Israel, I said, as a Christian, you cannot look at this little country, the Mediterranean to its back, surrounded on three sides by Arab nations that want to kill them, and to see them survive and prosper, you cannot deny that God did it. You cannot deny the hand of God. And we have some things to say today. I want you to turn in your Bible, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. This is the great time of the dedication of the temple that when Solomon would dedicate the great temple and the Spirit of the Lord, hallelujah, fill the house. And it said the priest, the power of God, the Shekinah glory of God was so strong that the priest could not even stand to minister. I believe that's going to happen again. I believe we're going to see a move of God where the Spirit is going to be so strong that people will just fall out like cordwood. I believe that. Beginning in verse 1, this is a sermon that Solomon preached. So, yes, Solomon. Then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. But I have built a house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel, and all of the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake, and with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be ruler over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. I'm going to read that again. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people, Israel. And I want to minister for a few minutes the title, Jerusalem, the Chosen City of God. When powers of the world, no matter how great their armies may be, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much oil they may have, when they come against Israel, when they come against Jerusalem, they're not fighting the Jews. They're fighting against God. And God always wins. Jerusalem, the chosen city of God. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the presence of the Lord that has been in this place. We ask this morning for your anointing. Anoint me to speak that which you have laid upon my heart. Help me to articulate that and only that which you won't said. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. It was 1948. It was the day that the United Nations would be voting on the Partition Act, whether or not the nations of the world would stand in agreement to allow the nation state of Israel to once again exist. In Jerusalem at that time, while the announcer on the radio was giving the tallies of what nations would do, in a plaza there were thousands of Jews standing there with bated breath. Families, old, young, children, teenagers. Many of them in the crowd had been born in what was then called Palestine. 
Scores of others, though, had just arrived in the last year, their arms still bearing the tattoo that identified them as survivors of the Holocaust. They were looking with bated breath, as I said, at a building that was before them, and on the second floor there was a balcony on that building, and the door was open, and inside of that room that overlooked the balcony was the leadership that made up the, the men that made up the leadership of Israel. Not elected, but they were the ones who had galvanized the people. In the middle of the room, as they were listening, as the nations would be called out and they would either say, we abstain, or no, or yes. Ten nations had already abstained. They were too cowardly to step up to the plate. Thirteen nations had voted no. And for the petition vote to go through, a certain percentage of yes votes had to be obtained. In that room, sitting among the men, there was the man that would be the first prime minister of this fledgling nation, the George Washington of Israel. His name was David Ben-Gurion. Now, that was not his real name. His real name was David Green. He was born and raised in Europe. He had a burning sense of destiny, that his destiny laid in what was then called Palestine. And he had left at a young age, and he had given his whole life for this moment. He was a journalist. That was his trade. As I said, his real name was David Green, and he changed his name one night as he was writing an editorial column. And as he got to the end and he typed his name, David Green, he said, that name just does not resonate. I want a name that will identify me as a Jew. I want a name that will identify me as a Zionist. And so he chose the name Ben-Gurion, and it means in Hebrew, son of a lion cub. No more appropriate name was ever taken by anybody. One by one, they begin to hear the nations abstain, no, yes, no, yes. And finally, it was coming to the end. And finally, I think it was Panama that gave the final yes that put them over the number needed. And the moment that that vote rang out, these men, many of them in their 60s, old, elderly, some of them had survived the Holocaust, they broke down and they began to weep. And finally, David Ben-Gurion stepped out on the balcony to those thousands that were waiting and he gave the news. And when he gave the news, the people erupted as you could imagine. They began to cheer. They began to shout. Many of them broke down and began to sob in tears. Music began to play, and they began to, as I said, dance around, and Ben-Gurion stood there with his cabinet around him, taking in the festivities, really speaking to no one in particular, but speaking to all those on that Balcony, he said, Today we dance, tomorrow we spill blood. Today we dance, but tomorrow we spill blood. Because the Arab world, the five major nations that surrounded Israel, 
They had already made their boast that if the United Nations votes to allow Israel to partition and become a state, we will drive the Jew into the sea. That was their battle cry. Now, understand something. These were not backward nations, as some would think. Egypt had a fully functioning, mechanized army, tanks. They had an air force. The proliferation of jets was not prevalent, but they had the very best in fighter planes available at that day, British Spitfires. Iraq, the same thing. A complete air force, a complete mechanized, everything that an army needed to destroy the enemy. Egypt alone, as the vote was being taken, had been begun to mobilize and just in fighting men in infantry, they amassed 10,000 troops. Not counting the tanks, not counting the planes that they would be able to put in the air. When David Ben-Gurion stepped off of that balcony, he realized we have no army. All they had was a home guard, the Haganah and the Uragon, and they didn't get along. The Uragon were ferocious fighters, and they believed in literally an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If an Arab blew up a Jewish building, they would blow up too. If an Arab killed a Jew, they would kill 10. They hated the British as well. If, if, and many Jews were killed by British in that time as they occupied the land. And if one British killed one of ours, we're going to kill two of theirs. The Haganah was a little more controlled, but they were squabbling, couldn't get along. And he said, we have no tanks. We have no cannon. We don't have an army with all of that which is needed to withstand an invasion. Matter of fact, just three months before, excuse me, four months before this event, Ben-Gurion had dispatched his number one fundraiser to the United States to raise money. We have to get weapons. We have to be able to fight. We can't fight on courage alone. We've got to have guns. We've got to have bullets. Give us the means to fight. He called America the pocketbook of the land because it was America and thank God, it was American Jews that had been funding all of their efforts up to this point. His chief fundraiser, his name was Kaplan, he came, and to his consternation and heartbreak, America's pocketbook was closed. He came back to Jerusalem. All of the cabinet had gathered together to hear how much money he raised. Ben-Gurion had estimated we'll raise $20 million. When he came back, he said, I couldn't hardly raise a penny. If we're lucky, we may have $5 million come in. And Ben-Gurion shook because he knew without American money, there was no way. He slammed his fist on the table and stood up and said, I will go. I will go to America right now. And I will 
try to raise the money, thinking that if they see me, if they hear me, I will open their pocketbooks. But all of a sudden, one lone voice of dissent, as far as him going to the America, stood up and began to speak and said, no, you're needed here. The time is too critical. We cannot afford to have you anywhere but Jerusalem. We need you here. That voice was the only voice that had the courage and did from time to time stand up to Ben-Gurion and challenge him. And the funny thing was, it was not a man. It was a woman. Born in Kiev, but raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And in the streets of Denver, Colorado, during World War I, when the labor movement was strong out west, she had gone out west to get involved in the labor movement, and it was on the streets of Denver, Colorado that something began to stir in her heart that says, I've got to go to Palestine. She had never been there before, but something began to stir in her. That was gold in my ear. What a woman. She said, I'm going right now. She didn't even have time. They were meeting in Tel Aviv. She didn't have time to be smuggled because you couldn't drive from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem just a drive. You couldn't do it. It was roadblocks. It was ambushes. You had to be smuggled in and out. She didn't even have time to pack. It was the dead of winter here in the States. She got a plane and she got out of Israel. She had just a, a flimsy summer dress and a little bitty suitcase. And when she stepped off in New York, that was her first point of embarkation. She had to go before the immigration department. They had to approve whether or not they would let her in. And, and she, all she could tell them was she was going to be here for a short time, but she didn't know how long. And one of the questions that she had, they asked, she had to prove was, how much money do you have to take care of yourself while you're in America? She said, sir, I have $10 to my name. And he said, well, how do you expect to take care of your needs on $10? She smiled and looked at him and said, young man, I have a big family. Somebody needs to shout on that. I have a big family. She got transportation to Chicago because that was the first thing. She had to get to Chicago, Illinois because... The largest meeting of American Jews was meeting in an annual convention at one of the major hotels there in Chicago. She told them she was coming, and she said, you must let me speak. They very grudgingly consented. She stepped up to the microphone. She said herself, and I quote, she said, I was trembling. I didn't know how they would accept me. She said, you must believe me when I tell you that I have not come to the United States solely to prevent 700,000 Jews from being wiped off the face of the earth. During these last years, the Jewish people have lost six million of their kind, and it would be presumptuous indeed of us to remind the Jews of the world that 700,000 Jews are in danger. That is not the question. If, however, these 700,000 Jews survive, then the Jews of the world 
will survive because of them. And their freedom will be forever assured. But if they don't survive, she said there is little doubt that for the centuries, that for centuries to come, there will be no Jewish people left. There will be no Jewish nation. And all of our hopes will be smashed. In a few months, she told the audience, a Jewish state will exist in Palestine. We shall fight for its birth. That is natural. We shall pay for it with our blood. That is normal. The best among us will fall. That is certain. But what is equally certain is that our morale will not waver no matter how numerous our invaders may be. She warned these invaders would come with cannon and armor. Against those weapons, sooner or later, our courage will have no meaning, for we will have ceased to exist. She said, I'm here for one purpose, to ask the Jews of America for 25 to $30 million to buy the heavy arms that we need to face the invaders' cannon. My friends, she said in making her plea, we live in a very brief present. When I tell you we need this money immediately, it does not mean next month or the next two months. It means right now. It is up to you to decide whether we shall continue our struggle or not. We shall fight. The Jewish community of Palestine will never hang out the white flag before the Mufti of Jerusalem. But you can decide one thing tonight, whether the victory will be ours or the victory will be the Mufti. That was the Muslim ruler of Jerusalem. She sat down. That's all she said. She sat out. There was a pregnant pause. Nothing happened for a second or two. Then all of a sudden, these American Jews, these businessmen, the weight of those words hit them right between their eyes. And they begin to realize what was before them. They said... In every little plate, they had a card, of a pledge card. And they said for the next few minutes, well, first thing that happened, all of a sudden, somebody began to clap. And as one clapped, all of a sudden, all of them began to clap. Then all of a sudden, they began to rise to their feet in a thunderous standing ovation. They said that men fill out that card, and begin to run up to the front, handing her her pledge card. Businessmen literally ran out of that meeting room in that, that ballroom in that Chicago hotel and ran to the phones and woke their bankers up and literally put their businesses up. How much money will your bank loan me for my business? Why? Do you want to expand? No. Are you hiring more people? No. Do you need to buy new equipment? No. Well, what's the money for? For Israel. For Israel. For Israel. For my people. My people are facing the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army is behind them, and the Iraqi army, and the Jordanian army. There's no way they can survive. Give me every penny you can give me. And the money began to come in a few days later when she finally finished the tour. She sat down, tallied up the money. She needed to raise $25 million at the least. But when everything was tallied up, gold on my ear had raised $50 $50 million. Somebody needs to shout. Somebody needs to praise the Lord. And that was $1948. And in 1948, $50 million was a chunk of change. 
And it was this nation, America, that can take note that because of our generosity, Israel made it. We literally became the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Now, do you understand that? This nation is a living prophecy of the Word of Almighty God. When it comes to touching this little spit of land, when it comes to touching that pe the people called the Jews, he said to Abraham so long ago, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And we stand today as the most powerful nation in the entirety of the world. And one of the main reasons is that this nation has stood behind and with side by side with Israel. Somebody needs to shout. Our greatness is not necessarily tied to our military. It's not tied to our GDP. It's not tied to General Motors or Apple or whatever industry else that you want to think of. But the reason why America is who she is and America is what she is is because we have honored the Word of God in supporting the nation of Israel. One of the nations in that historic vote that abstained was England. England who occupied Palestine. Their vote or no vote, they're abstaining to vote one way or the other. They were cowards. I know this goes into England, and I love England. It's my favorite outside of the United States. It's my favorite country in the world. But people wonder, why has England, why is England no longer the great power that she used to be? Go back to 1948. As we are living testaments of the prophecy of the Bible, so too are they. And every country, when you go down the list, every country that either voted against Israel or abstained, not a one of them can be called a bastion of liberty or prosperity. What God puts in his word, he means. And if we will obey his word, his face will shine upon us. If we obey his word, he will bless us in the city. He will bless us in the field. He will bless us when we put our hand to whatever we put our hand to. He'll bless us in the house. Everything we put our hand to, God will bless. If we'll just be obedient to the word of God. We are, we are now getting more direct information, news, concerning the atrocities that was perpetuated against these Jewish civilians as Hamas in a cowardly, dastardly, evil attack. I read it on the Fox News website and I saw a news report this morning from a reporter there. Before I go to what was in the print article, this reporter for, and I don't think he was a Fox News reporter, I think he was a stringer, but he said, he said, we have been interviewing the first IDF, Israeli, Israeli Defense Force, that's the name of their army, 
soldiers that discovered the bodies. And this is the quote. I heard it this morning. He said, they told me that the horror they witnessed, that Hollywood, in its scariest, most horror movie, could not come up with anything as horrible as what we saw. In the article that I read, now some of you got a queasy stomach, but I don't really care. You need to hear the truth. One of those IDF report came out, it said, as they were performing autopsies on all that were murdered to categorize and catalog the brutality and the viciousness. They said women, Jewish women, young, old, middle-aged, were so forcefully gang raped that their pelvic bones were actually broken in two. Then some of them were decapitated, others shot in the head. Then he said, but the most horrible thing And I can't comprehend this. This could only, what I'm about to tell you, could only come from someone who's demon-possessed. We found a woman who was pregnant. And these animals, that was his term, these animals, cut, up, cut, her, oops, cut her wide open took her baby out of her womb and decapitated the baby. And then decapitated the mother. And that is what too many people are in the streets protesting their allegiance to. They are of their father, the devil. Now understand that. Now, this is no place for, well, my opinion or that. No, 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 no. Any sane person, no matter what side of the street you're on, whether you're a conservative or you're a liberal, there is absolutely no way that you can defend the horror and the butchery and the atrocities that was carried out against these innocent people. And I'm going to say it right now. Any politician, any college professor, any student that sides with that, you are possessed of the devil. You are going to hell. You need to get right with God. There's going to be a special place in hell for you to burn because that is nothing but animals. That is what we're seeing is the result of sin. What we're seeing is the result of when a entire nations give themselves over to the powers of demon spirits. And every Muslim nation is ruled by demon spirits. And so too is every American that does not stand up for Israel and does not stand up for their right to defend themselves. Now, why, as Christians, let's lay it out real quick. Why, why should we be so proactive in our stance for Israel. Well, I'm going to give you some information that, so, and the reason for it, you should know it, but I'm surprised some of the most biblically illiterate people are Christians. 
hello. And when you're on the job, I want to give you some information. When you're in the mall and people bring it up, or you're over the dinner table and people bring it up. You see, the second, before I finish this up, not only we got these animals in America protesting in favor, but another major problem is the percentage of Americans, it just says, que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. It's not our job. It's not our country. Our end to our future. In the coming days, because we're getting ready to wrap this thing up. The end is coming. But what we do now as a nation will determine what God does for us or doesn't do for us. Genesis chapter 12. This is the first proclamation by Jehovah God. Concerning what now we call Israel, he would reveal himself to an idol worshiper by the name of Abram, Ur of the Chaldees. Tradition says that Abram and his family, they were pagan. They were idol worshipers. They were wealthy. And they owed their wealth to the fact that they were the manufacturers of figurines of the many various gods that they worshiped in that part of the world. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how God got through to Abram. But we know that when God created Adam and Eve, he put in the heart of every person, that which is called conscience. The Apostle Paul, commenting on that later on, he would say that an honest heart will just look at nature and recognize that there had to be a power greater than man to bring this to be. And no doubt in Abram, as he was in his factory, churning out these little demonic figurines, symbolic of the different gods they worshiped. Sooner or later, something began to stir in his heart. This can't be all there is. How can these stupid looking figurines made by our hand, by what we think this God, who we've never heard speak, and we've never felt. We've never seen him directly involve himself in the affairs of our lives. And in the questioning in his heart, no doubt, that's when the Holy Spirit just like you. Some of you, you were in the valley of decision and your mind was going back and forth. Is this Jesus real? Is this Bible real? Is what it says real? And you begin to question. And then the Holy Spirit took over from there. And he brought people into your path. And he began to reveal himself to you. And now you're sitting here today. You're watching me right now wherever you may live. And you're clothed and in your right mind. You're clothed with a garment of righteousness. You're clothed with a garment of holiness. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Because of Jesus Christ. He began to stir. And God told him, leave, leave this land into a land that I will show you. Now, God didn't reveal to him Canaan at that time. You see, 
Faith must be exercised for God to reveal himself further. And as Abraham began to obey, he said, you got to leave your land. You had to leave your land of sin. We don't live in Egypt anymore, but we're children of God. We've left Egypt and all of its bondage behind us. But not only do you have to leave the land, you got to leave your kinfolk. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than your relationship with your kinfolk. You must not let kinfolk hold you back from being all that you can be in Jesus Christ. We're to love them, we're to pray for them, but we're not to bow to their whims when it comes to our testimony of the King in Kings and the Lord of Lords. If they don't like it, they don't like it. But we don't change who we are, we don't change what we are, and we don't change what we believe. Can somebody shout this morning? I know it hurts. I know it breaks your heart. Oh, but there's so much more awaiting you. And, and understand this, your firm resolve to not give in, your firm resolve not to bow the knee may be the very catalyst that will eventually penetrate that darkness and bring to them the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that you now have. Woo! Hallelujah! Then he told Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. So what I'm giving you is the Bible. So when people have a contrary, you say, no. This is the oldest book in the world. And this book is right. He said, not only are you to leave the land, your kinfolk, but as you leave and I reveal each step of the way, I will give you a land. Now, Abraham... Oh, let me, before I finish that, let me finish. And not only would he give him a land, but he promised him that he would make of him, from him, a great nation. Now, we want things done. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like going to Chick-fil-A. I mean, that, you may not like their chicken, but they got their act together. I mean, you pull up, and before you can hardly get your window down, they're like, can I take your order? <laughs> then you give them the order before you turn around. They're, they're running out. They're running. How do I know this? I was there yesterday. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I got to pay. I'm trying to put my seatbelt back on. And they're running. They're, they're little girls running. Mr. Donnie, Mr. Donnie. Here's your food. Well, we think God acts that way. No. God's plan most of the time is very slow being revealed. So Abraham would not see a nation or a land in his lifetime. Isaac, his son, would not see a nation or a land. But his great-grandson, Jacob, from his loins, his sons, would come forth. And from these 12 sons, he would bring forth a mighty nation. And when you look at these sons, 
Everything about them is a perfect picture of where Israel is today. They rebelled against Joseph. Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ. They wanted to kill him just as the Jews would put him to death through Roman authorities later. But they became cowards and they sold him into slavery for just a few shekels. Just like Jesus was betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. And Joseph, a type of Christ, finds himself in a strange land accused of a crime he didn't commit and in prison. But the scripture says repeatedly, but God was with Joseph. And I'm here to say it today. The nation of Israel is backslidden. They're not walking in covenant relationship with him. But don't judge them today. Don't see them today as they are. Because in spite of their obstinance, in spite of that spirit of slumber that I preached about last week, the Bible still says God is with them. Hallelujah. The hand of God is on that nation. It is God's nation. Oh, I got, oh, I got singers, musicians, come on back. Then God knew they would rebel. And the Bible is full. I don't have time to go through them all, but the Bible prophesied that they would be scattered. We saw it under the Assyrians, the Babylonians. We saw it in 70 AD. They were scattered. But the Bible also prophesied that there would be a regathering. A regathering. Now, most people don't realize this as I get ready to close. World War II, there was more to it than you realize. World War II was as much a spiritual conflict as it was a military conflict. You see, Satan's plan is very simple. If he can make the Bible fall apart over its prophecies, then all of the Bible is a lie. Therefore, the powers of darkness put it into the heart of Adolf Hitler, the final solution. Over six million Jews murdered. It was Satan's attempt to cause the prophecies. If there's nobody left, there's nobody to regather. But he failed. And it took, and see, prior to World War II, the Jews of Europe, they, they were not interested. I don't want to go to Palestine. That desert country with a bunch of mules. It's not civilized. It's not modern. They had no desire. But just like God, with the children of Israel in Egypt, he slowly began to lift his hand to cause persecution by Pharaoh. See, they were comfortable in Egypt. They wanted to stay in Egypt. They had their own land, the land of Goshen in the middle of Israel. They were favored citizens. But God allowed another Pharaoh to come on the scene. And he saw all these Israelites and he grew angry and he grew scared and he began to lift his hand. And persecution began to come against them. Without that persecution, they didn't want to leave Egypt. But when the persecution came, they wanted out of Egypt. And what Satan meant for harm God would turn it for good. Hallelujah. And he would put that cry in them to come back. So we have the prophecy of the formation of the country. We have the prophecy of the scattering. We have the prophecy of the regathering. All leading up to one thing. First, the rapture. 
the rise of the Antichrist, the great tribulation, and then the battle of Armageddon, where Israel will be saved. And the very ones, as a nation, they say, we don't believe in Jesus. They will be the ones. Those streets will run red with blood. It will look like they're going to be destroyed by the hordes of the Antichrist. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible said, I will lift up a standard. Oh. And the one whom they crucified, the one who they rejected, oh, somebody needs to shout. They will bow before, and they will identify him. You are the Messiah. Somebody needs to shout. It's God's land. It's God's people. And then finally, it's God's city. In 1 Samuel, as I close, Saul is king. It's the great standoff between the Philistines and the children of God. Saul is not God's choice for king. But Israel didn't want to wait on God's time or God's man. The church very seldom chooses God's man. They most of the time choose a Saul. Amen. Goliath stands there mocking them. Send me somebody to fight. Saul couldn't get anybody to go fight. I mean, I would, I'm five foot nothing. That dude was nine feet tall. Some scholars, I don't know if they're right or not, said that he had six fingers on each hand. I don't know, six toes, I don't know if that's right. I just know he's bigger than me. And, and David, a type of Christ. He see, he hears the mocking tones, he said, is there not a cause? Meaning, isn't there a reason that somebody should go out there and fight him? Amen. And they mock him, but David says, I'll go. And when he walks out there, Goliath mocking him. What? what why are you insulting me? Sending this nothing teenager. He was probably about 17, 18 years old. But what? But what he didn't know is greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And David, he says, you come against me with your sword, your shield, your spear. But I come against you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. And today, and today, they will know that there is a God in Israel. And he takes that sling, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit takes it off and guides it like a heat-seeking rocket. And it finds the only place on Goliath's body that is sensitive to danger but not protected. Right between the eyes. And boy, that rock hit him, propelled by the power of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. The same power that opened the Red Sea. The same power that opened the Jordan River. The same power that anointed Samson to put his arms around those pillars in that Philistine chapel and bring it down and to kill the enemies of God. The same power that caused an ax head to float. The same power that caused the sun to stand still. Guided that little rock found its mark, and he died. And David runs 
to where his dead carcass is. He picks up his sword, probably so heavy he had to pick it up with two hands. And then one fell swoop, he brings it down and chops his head off. And then he takes that head by the hair and he stands on top of the giant's corpse and he holds that head in his hand. Woo! 2,000 years ago, when Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb victorious over death, hell, and the grave, symbolically speaking, in his hand was the head of the evil one. In his hand was the head of Satan. He walked out victorious over every power, every demon spirit. Oh, somebody needs to shout this morning. And then the Bible said uh, that he took the head with him and he took it to a place called Jabus. Jabus was a fortified city of the Jebusites right in the middle of Israel. God had given the command when the children of Israel occupied the land, you're to run them all out. But because of ungodly leadership and a nation more intent on lining their pockets, they didn't obey God and they left some of the enemy there. Our greatest problem in America is not the nations of the world that are against us, it's the enemies that are in our own country. And, and he buried the head. Why? Well, Jabus, and well, a little later, after he's king of Israel, he would lead an expedition. And they would defeat the Jebusites. And he would occupy the city called Jabus and change the name to Jerusalem. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 He said, I will put my name there forever. I said it last week. I'm going to say it again. The day is coming when the eyes of the world will look to Jerusalem because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is ruling and reigning. Stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, I know it looks bad for the nation of Israel, but I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Matter of fact, I'm going to change that. God done told me in his word that everything is going to be all right. Stretch your hands up right now all over this building. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we have gathered here this morning as the body of Christ, not just in this sanctuary, but by the multiple thousands and hundreds of thousands that are watching us, not only across the United States, but in Canada, in Central America, South America, across Europe, Russia, the islands of the sea, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, New Guinea, and every place else this signal goes. I pray that the body of Christ would be vigilant in this period of time to stand up and be bold for Israel. We don't approve, Lord, of everything they say, everything they do, but we don't see them as they are. Give us eyes to see them as they shall be. Because you have a plan. You have a will. And that plan and that will will be carried out. We pray 
for Mr. Netanyahu. We pray for the Knesset. They are divided as a people. We pray that this horrible event would serve as a catalyst to bring them together and that you would give them wisdom just as you gave to David's mighty men of valor, men who had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Give them clarity, then give them the strength to carry it out. And Lord, I pray for the leaders of the United States of America that no matter what other countries may say, that we will never waver in our support of this tiny nation that we will stand. And Lord, if every country in the world turns their back upon this little nation, let the United States of America stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, to give her the money, to give her the weapons, whatever she needs to defend herself. And Lord, if we'll do that, you'll bless us. You'll bless this nation you'll bless your church and we give you all the praise and glory and everybody said amen and amen come on give the lord a hand clap of praise let's go out of here rejoicing because god has got it god is in control hallelujah and like i said i got a feeling everything's gonna be all right we'll see you tonight at six o'clock well jesus i'll never forget what you've done